There we go. Stani, you're here. Awesome. Thanks for joining. Can you hear me okay? Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> hey, 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 good to see you again, man. Thanks for joining. Gosh, we are spreading the globe. Uh, you know what? I think we can get started then. Uh, maybe just give it a minute to see if anyone else joins. Uh, by the way, we are live streaming this on etherealsummit.com, so I expect most will end up watching it there uh, and potentially on like a Twitter or YouTube. Okay, cool. You know what? We'll get started here. And I'm um, just double checking. Can everyone hear me through my mic? Okay. Uh, nothing's uh, staticky or or soft. No, no, all good. Yeah. All good. Great. You all look awesome. Okay. So, hey, welcome to our second Ethereal sessions. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm DeFi Dad. I work on the Ethereal Summit team. So we're going to continue hosting these sessions every two weeks. Uh, they are meant to highlight trending and fundamental topics important to the Ethereum uh, and blockchain community. Our next Ethereal sessions is two weeks from now on Thursday, July 30th. Uh, that happens to fall on the fifth year uh, anniversary of the launch of Ethereum. So that'll be a really exciting session, I hope, uh, as well. And so tune in for that. And we'll be announcing speakers soon for that as well. And so before we get started, just a special thanks to uh, our sponsor who's been with us actually for over six months now, Ave. So thank you, Stani. Uh, coincidentally, I uh, wanted to have you on today, but also appreciate you all sponsoring us. Uh, so just a reminder too, if you're not familiar with Ave and you've been living under a rock, uh, one of it's one of the leading DeFi platforms built on Ethereum where you can lend and borrow Ethereum based assets. And there's all sorts of new innovations coming like credit delegation that I'm really excited for. So you can check them out at Ave.com. Uh, we are also seeking uh, sponsors for Ethereal sessions or future Ethereal sessions. So if you're interested, please email us at info at ethereal all right, with that out of the way, uh, we can start to kick off into introductions. Uh, so today we, we are going to discuss one of the hottest topics in crypto and specifically Ethereum and DeFi. Uh, we're gonna discuss what is yield farming. We're gonna try to define it, debate the pros and cons of it, uh, including how does one ben benefit from it and then what are the risks associated with it. And so fortunately for us, we have this awesome panel of many of the DeFi founders who have actually built apps and platforms on Ethereum that have enabled uh, this yield farming uh, meme to take off. Uh, yield farming is also commonly referred to as liquidity mining. So if, you're, uh, if you've heard of that, it's, it's actually the, the same thing. Uh, so we're gonna kick off with allowing each of you to uh, introduce yourselves, of course, but then uh, please just give us a, you know, a one or two minute pitch on how you think about what is yield farming, or maybe like, how do you explain it? Like what's important about it? Uh, and then we'll break out into more of like a, a, a true panel discussion on these topics. So uh, we have today, we have uh, Jean Miao, who is head of operations and co-founder of MCDEX. That's an, an uh, ETH Perpetuals uh, uh, exchange that recently launched. We have Fernando Martinelli, who is co-founder and CEO of Balancer. We have uh, Tina, Jen, which I'm sure I just mispronounced. Tina is uh, uh, Tina has done a lot of things, but one of the many things she's done is she's founder of HoneyLemon.Market, uh, which I, I believe the proper URL is HashEdge.io. I'll let her talk more about that. We have Samyak Jane, the co-founder and CTO of Instadap. We have Stani here, which I'm just going to refer to you as Stani because I don't. I think in DeFi, there's only one Stani. So we, we don't even have to say your last name, Stani. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of Ave. And then we have Anna Andrianova, who is uh, CEO and founder of Acropolis. So thanks for joining me, everyone. Uh, does, does anyone want to kick off with just trying to define what is yield farming? Fernando. <laughs> Also, to, I, I can help if, if it, I can give like a quick one, two on it, if it inspires some ideas, but love to have one of you kick off. Oh, uh, Fernando, you'll, oh, there we go. Now you're coming in. Hey, Fernando, your, your mic isn't working. Um, you know what? Try this. 
click click to your default mic. Sometimes the auxiliary mics can be screwy with uh, with Zoom. Any better? Or let's see if. Yeah, and you're unmuted. How, how about this? Let's give it a sec. Anyone else want to kick off just while we're figuring out that mic issue? All right. All right. Oh. So I'll just I'll just uh, kick off. Go. All yeah, right. go ahead, Sam. Yeah. So yield farming in my terms uh, is uh, you are incentivizing users in DeFi token um, to use your platform. Now it can be anything. Uh, it can be you are depositing liquidity or you are doing some transaction or you are doing anything. So basically incentivizing users to use your platform more. So, uh, uh, and as the user, user will grow, your platform will have more trust and everything. So in a long term, long term, uh, it, so it's, it's basically, uh, giving rewards, uh, to, uh, to get the protocol to a particular level. And once, uh, it gets to a particular level, then, uh, the protocol is and users will already use it. Awesome. Thanks, Samyak. Fernando, did, did you want to try again? Maybe can, the mics. There we can go. Can you hear yeah, me now? Yeah. Oh, right. awesome. You're all good. Thank you. Yeah, go right ahead. My Zoom is a bit buggy. Yeah, so um, I didn't get what Samyak said, but uh, for us at Balancer, yield farming is kind of is a meme, and the essence to it is to get your protocol distributed because it gets really uh, relevant and useful when it gets to a decentralization kind of level where like people know it's not a, a VC coin, it's not a company that's behind all the efforts uh, that are kind of developing that, that uh, protocol. So I think it's, it's, a, it's the best way so far we came up with to distribute ownership of something. So yeah, people thought of airdrops and many other ways to distribute ownership of, of protocols and even token sales, they have to pay to, to be, become part of, of the protocol. And yeah, youth farming is nothing but giving users of a protocol the ownership of a little bit of that protocol. And that has value in so far as people believe that that protocol will be valuable in the future. So youth farming is a, a, a very bad idea if you're just kind of uh, giving out ownership of something that doesn't have any meaningful added value to users. So that, I, I believe the balancer is an example where if you have more liquidity, then you get better conditions for traders to trade and that generates profitability for pools. And that is mm -hmm. kind of a flywheel effect that then um, eventually in the future, when we get rid of BAL and or don't, don't, don't distribute it anymore, the protocol will be at a stage where not only will it be very decentralized with tokens belonging to people who have been involved and use the protocol so they know the protocol they want its best, but they will also be profitable without the bow being distributed because of the mechanics of the system. So I think that's that's the, the, the most important point here is to, to make sure that it's not just distributing something that doesn't have any value without that distribution. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Fernando. Uh, Gene, I was wondering if you could go next, just because you you actually have been running a liquidity mining program with MC Dex, mm -hmm. and I, in the last week yeah. or so, I thought you launched it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's been running for for a, a week, I think. Yeah, I I think I have a very similar point of view with Fernando because I think in my terms that uh, liquidity mining or year farming is actually a tool for a platform to accelerate the growth of the whole ecosystem by rewarding them with the native tokens. But what behavior to reward is actually quite critical here. It's like we do want to um, distribute to distribute the tokens to the stakeholders that they can contribute uh, to the long-term sustainability of the whole project. Yeah, so I think uh, for us is, uh, yeah, just like Fernando just described, described because I'm Stacks, we have introduced the AMM model to enable the decentralized uh, perpetual contracts. So we are, by, by incentivizing the liquidity providers, we are 
actually creating a virtual cycle here by, which means that like uh, by having better liquidity that will have a lower slippage, which is a good price for the traders then uh, increase the in trading volume that can generate more uh, profit for the liquidity providers. So this is a kind of a feedback loop that can boost the whole ecosystem. Yeah, so the from the so yeah from the perspective of the platform, I think yeah it's a kind of a way to 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 do is especially when doing the kickoff. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jean. Uh, who'd like to go next? We still have Tina, Stani, Anna. Yeah, I think I think it's important to to add that it's not it's not a novel concept by any means. Uh, it's oh. been it's been around for a while and actually. Um, yeah, you can kind of trace the origins to what uh, Jake uh, from uh, from Coinfund referred to as generalized mining um, a while back, right? And it's interesting how these memes get recycled, relabeled, and then they sort of acquire a new life, right? Uh, if you look at, let's say, you know, you know, 18, 24 months ago, it wasn't doing a thing, right? It was just like, it, it, you know, we have token incentives, you know, then uh, sort of airdrops for the rage, and people realize that you know, airdrops don't work. And now it's essentially, you know, airdrops for value, for contribution to a particular protocol, right? Um, so yeah, as the Fernando said, it's, you know, it's a meme, and I think it's important to really appreciate the meme in the context of the evolution of the trends in the crypto ecosystem, right? And, it, and basically, you know, right now it's going through its second cycle with completely you know, different, you know, volume engagement. And this is, you know, what's, what's really interesting to observe and be involved in. Thanks, Anna. Super helpful. Uh, Tina, Stani, either of you want to go next? Tina, maybe, or? I feel like it's a standoff between you two. You're like, who's going to go? Who's going to, who's next? Okay. Um, I'll go because um, I don't want to drag down the conversation into the other, the Netherlands. So uh, maybe Stani can turn it back. <laughs> so, okay. I totally agree with what Anna was saying about the, essentially um, liquidity uh, providers are um, uh, just another form um, of the, uh, one of the classifications under the keepers of the network, which essentially um, they provide core functionalities um, that's very important to bootstrap and maintain the, if you view protocol economy as core, as game economy, it's kind of core game loop of the decentralized finance protocols. Um, just like mining, staking, and farming, um, liquidity mining or yield farming is also a metaphorical way um, to bootstrap this core uh, protocol um, uh keepers activity. Um, and um, it's just different agents at play. And so like, just like in layer one, security is uh, paramount and uh, uh, mining would be uh, staking will, and staking would be an important gamified mechanics. Um, liquidity is what is scarce in finance. And so like, however, what uh, today we're talking about, I would essentially call like the liquidity mining or yield farming 2.0. Um, if we consider last year, the game has, re if everyone remembers, is still chasing yield. But the chasing yield is about, um, I would say more or less of a slower pace speculation on the supply and demand imbalances uh, of the capital within. So essentially everyone was just trying to figure out where to uh, lend money to get a higher yield, which is uh, relatively, uh, I would say simple for humans. Um, you can still visibly check the dashboard and uh, manually uh, enter, and the gas price wasn't um, as uh, much of a roller coaster as this year. However, this year we're entering into a different game in a sense of it's, def it's DeFi yield on steroids. Uh, basically, um, it uh, the overlaying of gamification uh, of these airdrops basically turns up the pace and the competition of uh, yield chasing from these batting on liquid, uh, the supply and demand dynamics into um, more of a speculation on the market activity of what I would call 
um, feel free to challenge me a blank check on um, the future direction of protocol um, uh, uh, evolvement. And which is not a, uh, I don't, as I mentioned, it's not a good or a bad thing. It's a more intensified stimulation and simulation that essentially gamifies, provides a stronger, more automated, verifiable on-chain in this DeFi case, uh, or at least that's the direction that everyone's going at, than the normal airdrop. Because the mechanics of how these games work um, is uh, the, the, uh, in DeFi is uh, a bit special because it, most of the activity is on-chain. So that is actually more believable, but once again, it's still providing a stronger immediate feedback loop that is positive and optimistic um, to, uh, however, uh, and, ma uh, and mask the potential illiquidity of these blank, blank checks. Yeah, so I think that's a very convoluted way to, to, to say it. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I, I think that's really helpful. And, and we'll end up talking more about it. I think like after I'd like to hear what Stani um, thinks about how he defines yield farming. But I, th I think there's a question of is this a meme or is it a long lasting tool for DeFi teams to go to market and launch liquidity or is it both? Uh, so anyway, Stani, I'll, I'll let you go uh, next, though. What, what do you think of all of this? How do you how do you describe what is yield farming? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I think that me was a very good uh, kind of like analogy because in one way, uh, like that the whole DeFi is is kind of a meme and and the total lock value is kind of a meme because like the the things always existed in finance. We just basically are using technology that is is kind of like more efficient because of the interoperability by default and. And the fact of like the whole transparency transparency that we have uh, as a kind of like a tool, uh, I really uh, I think for example what we have seen in uh, in in uh, uh, yield farming there are definitely like they, they have innovation. It, it's not new when we compare like traditional uh, words of businesses and and how to kind of like engage the supply side or the demand side. There's there's kind of like nothing new, but we are doing it in, in quite interesting way at the moment. And I think like, uh, like uh, Estina, for example, said that the, the uh, DeFi has been about yield hacking. It's, it's, it used to be basically one protocol you deposit. Now you have two protocols. You can basically see like, let's say how, how you could optimize your yields or, or diversify a bit of risk that way. And then you have basically primitives that are built on financial primitives that are built on top of this protocol. So you could even further optimize, let's say you combine um, lending yields with trading yields and even, even some other uh, interesting uh, things. So I, I definitely think like uh, DeFi has been up, up to this point pretty much about like uh, how much value you can lock and, and how you incentivize that value, whether it's inside the ecosystem or outside and what's like yield farming, uh, from my perspective, has done pretty well. It has attracted those uh, CFI and even like traditional finance who are looking into the field to to basically encourage and to deposit. Uh, the the good side effect, I, I think, like the, the the good side effect about the uh, liquidity mining is the fact that you are getting uh, basically a share to govern a protocol in a usage based way. Now, the usage based way isn't exactly like the very uh, it's very difficult to, to uh, program something that is uh, difficult to game, like in the sense that uh, basically you, you want to encourage people to borrow, but then if you're paying people to take loans in a bank, it might lead to a situation where uh, you just increase risk, for example. Now we, we all have over collateralized lending and, and so forth, and we have uh, liquidity incentives like in Balancer where we, we basically don't have liquidity risk, but we might have like in the whole DeFi, different barriers of systemic risks and, and smart contract risk that people are sub subscribing into. And I, I think kind of like the, the it's a nice comparison in a way that uh, like some of the projects that are applying uh, liquidity mining are seeing it, it's, it kind of like a as a holy grail to get uh, liquidity, but we tend to forget that actually why people are using your product is, is for multiple reasons. 
And if, if DeFi will be about uh, basically capital allocation of, of best mathematical formulas, it will mean that the best mathematical formula will grab all the liquidity and, and the best kind of like yield farming strategies on top will grab the whole liquidity. So it definitely has been like uh, bringing more, uh, I would not say unnecessary value because that value is important for the growth. But I, I would say that it's not like a holy grail that basically you do growth hacking. And I would imagine something similar uh, compared to user experience when you go to a grocery store and you're buying something and you have subscribed into a store card where you're getting uh, bonus points uh, and you can use those bonus points to buy products for free. So basically kind of you're selling them or you can govern a, a, a protocol. So I think the governance aspect is the most beautiful outcome. I, I think people just uh, forget that actually like that's not a holy grail for the user growth. And we're still in DeFi stage where we're focusing too much on the kind of like value locked as a meme metric as well. I mean, uh, different DeFi protocols have different metrics. Uh, they might have, for example, trading fits like uh, trading volume fits more of uh, uh, liquidity pools uh, for swaps and maybe loan borrow volume uh, fits well or market size for over collateralized lending protocols. And I think at some point when we're, we get bored uh, into the amounts of locked value. So let's say if all the top 30 uh, DeFi protocols are holding hundreds, hundreds of millions worth of value, nobody any, anymore cares like who's basically holding uh, how much because it's kind of like the same ball part, but the magnitudes might vary. So we're basically going into a game where actually it's um, uh, more, more becomes a brand game. Like how do you serve your user and what kind of products you can provide them from your protocol and as a kind of infrastructure level or in the front, front, front end level basically. And why it's important is that like we already have track record with exchanges that it's actually not the, the, the go-to exchange might not be the, the one with highest volume there might be a risk associated if you trust the custody. Same thing is in, in, in DeFi with the smart contract risk, for example. And, and basically uh, there's reasons why people choose Coinbase, why people choose Binance and why people choose Kraken, I think, I think so. And that's like very important thing. And uh, during the era, I, I think like uh, we tend to not uh, focus enough, uh, let's say into security. So we're putting a lot of effort into creating programs uh, which attracts the liquidity, but we're not uh, creating programs enough which secures uh, that liquidity for the depositors. So I, I think in general, this uh, liquidity mining has been a very good thing. Uh, I think just uh, may, customizing them in a way that it, they're optimized uh, and, and servicing the, the, the exactly what you need is, is difficult, but we have seen that the current models are not that bad actually. And I, I think it's just basically optimizing that way. I, I just wish that we focus more on the uh, security side because uh, liquidity is also, it comes different shapes and, shapes and forms. And usually it might be even blind, which means that people are throwing money to get, uh, to get that value. And also it, it's kind of like interesting to see as an analogy, let's say if you will get a, a Tesla share for every, every mile you're driving Tesla, and basically you could use that share to, to uh, pump more uh, electricity into your car to sell it. Like, is, is that the objective of that liquidity mining program? Or do you actually want the participants to, uh, to keep that power that they get, get and actually use it in the protocol? And that's very difficult to, uh, to kind of like uh, design. But most of the, the kind of like uh, um, uh, schemes I've seen, they're pretty good in the ways that they are actually uh, people who want to just govern, they don't need to use the protocol and can buy from those who are selling. So there is a balance there. Okay, so so to summarize before we move on, um, I, th I think I'm hearing with yield farming or liquidity mining, we, we have two sides of the equation. One are often DeFi teams uh, or those that have built an app or, or like a decentralized exchange like MC Dex uh, or Monte Carlo Dex is what it is. Uh, you're wanting liquidity, so you've created incentives for folks to provide liquidity. On the other side of the equation, you have those who either the, the intention is to help them to have a voice also in the governance, uh, which means that in many cases you are trying to enable uh, someone to be able to earn some sort of like a yield, uh, or in most cases it comes in the form of a governance token. 
Uh, so I know I, I try to just dumb it down as yield farming is normally a program where you can earn multiple forms of yield. Uh, and that can be interest, market making fees on like balancer. Uh, and then uh, the third one is often these pooled rewards like the BAL governance token or the comp governance token. Um, so I guess moving on from this then, uh, Stani, you started to sort of lead us into it. Does anyone else want to chime in on, is, is this a lasting mechanism? Um, I think Tina was also like calling out, like it's not good, it's not bad, but we all kind of see the fact that, uh, I, I believe these are some of the best designed incentives in DeFi and Ethereum since at least I've been around for the last several years. But at the same time, uh, uh, yes, I, I don't, I don't believe that everyone is trying to earn the comp token at times to participate in governance. Obviously there's a profit motive there as well. Uh, throwing that aside, again, what, what do you all think? Like, is it good? Is it bad? I, I, and Fernando, you can speak from experience. Gene, you can speak from experience here. You, you've been kind of living this recently. Maybe, yeah, to, to the sustainability, I think it it is sustainable and it is going to be around for a long time time because you cannot successfully get your your protocol um your 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 project decentralized in a few months or even in a year right um comp has enough comp for i think four years to be distributed and balancer if we keep the same rate and again that can be changed by governance at any time um i think as gene was saying it's like a blank uh, or tina blank check where people just have full control um, if it keeps the same rate, it will last for almost nine years. So the, the, the only reason I think it could kind of fail is that people totally lose faith in a project. They believe that, for example, Balancer is doing uh, very, very badly and there's no future. And we're just distributing something that uh, went down to zero and people see no value in it. So it kind of cr crushes uh, on, on itself. But as long as people realize that it's not just about the value, um, like dollar value that you get every week when you get your BAL tokens for providing liquidity, it's more about you, you being part of something that eventually could get bigger and bigger. And here you always have to think about the whole DeFi and Ethereum ecosystem uh, at large, because if you have like a part, like 10% of something that is going to grow by a, a thousand X, you don't need to steal uh, market share from other projects. And, and, and those $10, if you believe in Ethereum and, uh, and DeFi, probably will be worth a lot more. And you wanna have a voice in how that product was shaped. So I, I, I'm very bullish and I agree with you, um, Travis, that this, this has been one of the best uh, kind of mechanisms to decentralize ownership of protocols that I've seen on Ethereum so far. And I'm, I'm, I'm biased, but I'm, I'm very bullish. And one nice thing that I think is uh, an important point that differentiates Balancer from, from Compound is that we are 100% sure and, and cognizant of the fact that there is no right way to do this. And we're just starting an experiment that will absolutely, like 100% sure, have to change as people try to game the system or find ways to, to extract more value than actually they should be getting. Uh, we, we, we decided to do this off-chain so we have this ability uh, of engaging the community, using BAO to vote on changes of how this calculation process is done. And that has been working like really well since, since we started, like the community came up with ideas to make sure that people are not just farming BAO tokens without really contributing to, 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 the, to the system. So that, that's, that's something that will evolve a lot I wouldn't say in the next months only, it's gonna evolve a lot in the next years. So before kind of coding something on chain at the like at the Ethereum layer, like Compound did, we, like, we, we took this uh, more kind of a hands-off approach of saying, yeah, this is, this is still new and we'll, we'll have to be able to make changes quite quickly to, uh, to, to, to adapt to a, a very fast changing uh, reality. What's it been like the last week for you? I, I, I just checked mcdex.io and it looks like you have 18,000 ETH in the margin balance, which is at least six, six or seven X what it was the last time I had checked. So 
uh, yeah, can you speak to your experience with this and maybe any like lessons you've already learned? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, like we have just only I uh, enabled the liquid mining for I think one week. It might be for us too early to say this, but I would like to share some points of view of whether like it's just a hype or is uh, can be sustainable. Uh, as I mentioned, I think after all, like the eel farming is actually a tool, and what what when we are like like judging or evaluating whether the tool is useful or not, we only need to like to focus on the goal, what the, the tool is used for. And um, the tool is actually used for uh, in a, it's like in, a, in the design is like to, uh, to contribute is for the users or for the providers to contribute more to the long-term eco ecosystem and all the long-term sustainability. Like uh, take MCDX as example that we actually have the user inten intensive design in 10 years. Like we have like 50% of the token for user incentive and with up to like 5% each year, which means we will distribute in the next 10 years. And the second point is the most important point is that the token, but by holding the token that the users can, can enjoy some profit from it. So that is, I think that is a, like that, that is also that we have been always talking about like the capture value that I think which is like more, most important here. Like the people won't just like dump it after they get the token. They will uh, hold it because it would, the token does generate some profit for them. Like for MCDEX, we are gonna have the transaction fee for the capture value of the MCB token. Yeah, so in this way, like all the whole design of the token system is like a very complicated. Uh, as mentioned, we have governance, we have a, a capture the, we have the, we have the function to capture the value. So in a, if the whole uh, token mechanism is designed in um, for a goal that for the long-term uh, sustainability of the whole ecosystem, I think that might be a very good chance to to, to keep this thing have sustainable. Yeah, that's my, my point of view. Samia, can you speak to how you've thought about designing these flash loan tools? Like how Instadap has participated in, uh, or really like helped to sort of like garner in all of this attention for, for yield farming. Um, and, and just some context for folks with Instadap, they, they have multiple recipes where they use flash loans, and it's just a few clicks for the average user, if, as long as you know how to use like a MetaMask. And I mean, what you've done is you've created these sort of superpowers to uh, earn uh, in different liquidity mining programs. So for example, with Compound, you earn more by lending and borrowing more. Well, you've enabled me to lend, die, and borrow, die, build a leverage position. And then if the market switches on me, and let's say the bat market starts earning more, I can do a debt and collateral swap. And these are, these are just incredibly powerful and complicated uh, transformations for, for anyone uh, to be able to do, but you've enabled it in a few clicks. So I'm just curious like how you've thought about designing these and sort of counterbalance that with thinking about like, what are the risks that you also enable with this? And so that there isn't a, a collapse uh, of the comp mining market. Yeah, so um, I mean, uh, before uh, comp launched the comp mining, uh, we had the feeling that it will burst off because of the company's valuation and people are actually getting more than what they're lending and uh, more than what they're borrowing. So basically they're earning free money on the borrowings. So we know that, that like this was going to blow off. So we created the tools according to the model that was going on, which was the rate, the higher the rate, the, the more uh, token you will earn. So yeah, I mean, we created the uh, maximum comp my, my, uh, maximizing tool and um, users just start using and uh, like the more the rates and uh, the more token, uh, the more comp you will earn. And so basically, um, what uh, so what I think like uh, on the on the comp governance is um, users users are uh, users are not uh, earning comp tokens for for the for the governance but they are earning uh, they are mining comp tokens because they want to earn real money like they will probably sell it for DAI for USDC for Ethereum or or anything else 
so they were getting higher reward so it was like it was easy to figure out like users will start shifting or new users will come into the ecosystem to uh, to start maximizing and their their position and it wasn't really possible to do with the normal compound uh, ui or a metamask address so we created tools where users can from when when we launched the initial tool it was like users can earn maximize like up to 30x comp uh if you are on dai and if you shift to usdt and and if the rates are higher depending on that i mean it also uh, included it it also uh, did a really uh, i i i would say awkward thing like uh bat market went up to 300 400 million and dai market currently is at 800 million i would say which uh, like people are just borrowing i, I mean uh, we, i would say that like it's cheating the protocol uh that's what that's not what it was meant for but uh depending on the, like they as they are earning more on the comp token rather than what they are borrowing every user is trying to do that and uh yeah so i mean uh basically uh, uh depending on all these rates and then the then when the comp uh, sorry compound protocol changed it to the borrowings so users yeah so users started borrowing dai from bad to dai and yeah so uh so uh, i would i would like to add few points here on the compound governance like many users think that uh, it's kind of a cheating to the protocol or something like that but i don't really think that uh because it's it's very early it's it's still very early and i think like there will be some point when compound compound protocol will reach to billions and billions of dollars because of this comp mining so this is a initial motivation and you are cheating the protocol but users will stop cheating the protocol when the borrow rates and the comp earning uh, sorry the comp earning is less than the borrow rates so then that that uh, that, that will be the point when user will seriously start using this comp, uh, comp compound protocol and that will happen when the market reaches billions of dollars so i think it's not the cheating but it's the part of growing the whole compound ecosystem and on the other side what uh, is benefiting the compound is they are they are collecting insurance pool because of this comp mining i mean like there is 900 million of dai market and 800 million of uh, borrowing market so they the 10% is going into the insurance pool so over time uh, because of this comp mining they will have a huge insurance pool which will also secure the whole protocol so i think uh, this is a very very good way to bring a lot of users a lot of big users and everyone into the ecosystem to use the protocols so uh, uh, one more example on the compound like before com governance it was at like 100 million and 150 million around that something and now it's around 700 million uh, and once it reaches to the billion dollars then the big player who wants to do a trade of 50 million 100 million 200 million like the big companies banks and other other because companies will start flowing in and then they will pro- provide the real value so then i think the compound can become a settlement layer uh, because of this huge market they have so i would say like this is a huge value providing system for the whole whole ecosystem and depending on how uh, i mean I, i won't say like the yield farming is is particularly good or bad it depends on how you are executing it and how what uh, what value does your protocol have but yeah so um depend yeah so yeah uh, i think yeah i i want to remind everyone there's been 16 proposals with compound since may 1st and not all of them have been uh, approved and executed some of them have failed as votes but that's a lot yeah. of that's a lot of activity in terms of governance so when whenever i hear anyone questioning the value of these governance tokens i'm like Have you seen that compound is number 1 in total value locked? Have you seen that it's at all-time highs? Have you seen that one of the more recent votes actually has it changed the mechanism by which the market with the uh with the most uh demand uh borrowing demand ultimately is the one that is earning the most comp, which is why Dai is leading and some of the gaming that was going on with markets i think like the bat tokens kind of gone away anyways does anyone else want to respond to anything that uh, samyak shared uh, i have a question for ana but i i wanted to give anyone a chance to respond if you got any ideas here anything okay cool. uh ana uh, one thing one thing oh, is yeah. like kind of like to remind like even even from our perspective at ave like the the leverage kind of like effect 
So one of the things is like very, very like, uh, I will not say scary because there's nothing wrong with leverage per se. I mean, it really is capital efficiency, but uh, kind of like, if you look at, for example, uh, Compound or even basically Aave, you, you see kind of this uh, pile up of leverage and kind of like in terms of comp farming as well. And like, that is one of the things uh, which is kind of like very tricky because like many times we are uh, thinking that uh, in DeFi, we, we have everything kind of like on chain and, and very transparent. And, and that if, if there is any kind of leverage, it's easy to, um, kind of de-risk uh, from that position. But if you look at 2008, and I'm, I'm just saying this um, not as a uh, kind of like a, uh, one position, but something that we need to really focus upon is to figure out like how do we measure the, the leverage positions? Because in 2008, uh, even like those uh, mortgages that were packaged, uh, they were rated in certain levels. So basically there was a custody and different credit ratings. And then they were securitized and, and basically put onto the market. And that was basically traded and on leverage. So we kind of have the same situation where we, we kind of know like that there is a lot of leverage. We, uh, we know how much the e ecosystem is exposed. I mean, the data is there. Uh, that's, that's, that's kind of like is granted, but so is in terms of uh, securitization. And, and you have also the watchdog watching and, and kind of like monitoring the situation as well. And then we have like the similar situation with custody, for example, whether it's Tether or USDC, where we don't see that much stuff. We just see basically audits and um, so forth. So kind of like one of the things that we really need to figure out in terms of leverage is how much DeFi can take leverage. And I, I think companies like uh, Gauntlet, with, which has done like market risk research, liquidity risk research, they have been doing like very... Uh, good job on on researching this. This is something like kind of like we as a community need to think about, like how much we can take leverage on on these assets that we have. So interesting. Thanks, Stani. Uh, Anna, a question for you. So, uh, Acropolis has a token, uh, and you're not a, a newer team. You've been around for the last few years. You you all have been building. Um, you know, I've gotten to see some of the the newer tools that are coming. That are you know, there's uh, just excited for simple tools like dollar cost averaging with Acropolis in the future. But I'm wondering, uh, as a veteran team, or, or again, not a newer team, uh, how are you thinking about all of this? Like, as you see it, you know, is, is this a consideration for the team? Um, you know, basically, what, what are the lessons that you're able to observe and sort of build upon? Uh, I mean, the main lesson is uh, never, never underestimate the speed at which uh, capital flows in crypto uh, move and how quickly they uh, they can move from one protocol to another, right? So, um, you know, again, in, in terms of what's happening, there's nothing fundamentally new, but obviously the, the confluence of, you know, of drivers, uh, you know, let's say you know, if, you know, if compound, <clears throat> incentivized borrowings last year, but given last year's economic climate in crypto, right, it would have been an entirely different outcome. Um, so what's showing is that the timing and reading of the trends is, is absolutely key. And it's even more important in crypto than it is in, you know, in fiat markets. To, to Stani's point, and, you know, completely agree, you know, we talked about this for a while, is that uh, what we're creating right now, especially with more complex yield farming strategies, and they're going to become even more complex in time. Uh, you know, that's why we're hiding a lot of the complexity under the sort of under the bonnet in our, you know, in our product, is that you know essentially we're recreating structured products, but without any of the um, you know, even attempts at risk management. Um, so the the downside of obviously what's happening now is that you know, a big sort of DeFi blow up is inevitable. Um, you know, we'll learn more, we'll, you know, we'll regroup, we'll, you know, rethink how we, uh, how we approach design. And, you know, I'm sure certain, limit, uh, certain limitations and caps will be embedded over time. Uh, the, the main lesson for us is, is um, really more about the timing, right? Um, so we had the governance token, 
you know, issued last year, uh, its functionality is not going to, like, you know, it was issued before it was fashionable. Uh, we, it, 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 for liquidity bootstrapping, bootstrapping purposes, we were going to provide token incentives before, you know, before liquidity mining was as fashionable as it is right now. So again, it's just a matter of, um, I guess a lot of the things that are really being met with, uh, you know, with enthusiasm right now, you know, a year ago, we're just like, mm, like, you know, that's fine, nothing particularly exciting. But the moment people get economic incentive from compound, which obviously completely blew up, right? It changes the mindset. So a combination of memes and financial incentives and the speed of capital um, and the, the fluidity of that capital and crypto is what makes it completely unique, right? So, um, you know, for us, you know, when, you know, we're not changing um, our token utility. It's, 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 you know, the same as this right now. And in terms of liquidity mining incentives, you know, a few uh, slight tweaks that we're working on that represent, if, let's say, deviation from the original plan of last year. Um, but clearly on the product side, the, the evolution and the blow up of uh, DeFi tools of the last, I would say, you know, six months has been, has been remarkable, right? And it's very, um, yeah, so it makes it super interesting working on the product um, and you know, interacting you know, with really, really smart engineers, really smart product people in the ecosystem, it's a lot of fun. Uh, um, I think the main thing that you know, we're focusing on is, is abstracting away all that complexity uh, because ultimately you know, all the narrative around uh, bringing crypto to the masses, you know, which by the way, I don't really kind of buy into, like nobody's talking about let's bring AI to the masses or let's bring machine learning to the masses. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, if you solve the need, um, the route to market and the distribution is, um, you know, something that can be usually uh, quite easily solved for. So essentially, you know, our view of the product level is, you know, solve like one or two basic needs, uh, present them in, you know, in, beautiful, uh, you know, easy uh, UX, UI, um, and abstract away as much of the complexity as possible because that complexity will continue to grow. And the risks that we, that we take on without understanding will continue to expand. Um, so yeah, I agree with Stani so far as having, you know, as a community, having a much more sophisticated take on the complexity of structured products that we create is very important because otherwise, you know, what's happening is rather than just providing alternative yield sources, which is super important in the economy that's going into negative race environment, you know, what we're also creating are, are essentially weapons of mass destruction, you know, um, on speed, right? Um, and, and, you know, what I personally would love to see would be you know, would be you know a way to basically discern, let's say, true uh, true leverage levels in complex yield mining uh, and yield farming positions, right? Um, and true exposures because there's a. Uh oh. Uh, I think she got cut off. Everyone else is okay though. Okay, Anna will rejoin in a second, hopefully. Um. Tina, did, did you want to expand on, on any thoughts there or any response to what Anna was discussing? Uh, yeah, well, I think in general, like, I think everyone uh, made a great point. And especially, uh, like, I think what, uh, like, a couple points I want to just uh, comment on. One is when it comes to timing, uh, not just uh, how the crypto um, industry sentiment, which is extremely important. It's also about like a slowly build up and the learning of the DeFi industry as a meme, defining and redefining constantly what uh, this industry is about. And um, we essentially uh, that was also critical to the timing of liquidity mining because it's more about having 
uh, almost like prior to the 2017, like I'm talking about purely in terms of sentiment and confidence, prior to 2017, uh, the bull run, essentially Ethereum being able to uh, bootstrap through uh, token economics and as well as um, like crowdfunding. And then uh, the surviving the DAO hack, it's kind of like uh, uh, instilling confidence into the general market in terms of what uh, incentives that new uh, incentive mechanisms that we're um, uh, we're creating here. And so um, I see the parallel from an evolution of a industry more as a, um, a microcosm that is uh, loosely coupled and learning uh, from each other, from the mistake and dependent on each other. And so the timing is very important that this year, um, it probably wouldn't have worked last year. Um, and the fact that it was, Compound wasn't the first to actually uh, be successful in terms of its, uh, I would say, um, uh, uh, the liquidity mining. Uh, it wasn't the first, but then it's definitely set a great precedent for the rest to come. And now we do see essentially a rush of every project is running to the market, trying to capitalize on this window of opportunities of essentially because of the great precedent that Compound has uh, set up up front. Um, then um, it actually did succeed in, uh, in, in drawing attention from non-DeFi, non-Ethereum DeFi, non, uh, like even the critics of uh, previous critics of, of De uh, DeFi uh, to actually uh, chime in. And so a lot of market attention is trying, uh, a lot of uh, players that have actually mature product or uh, product market fit, that have a clear goal of business monetization is coming to market. So we're seeing like faster and faster pace of Essential, uh, essentially un, in the trenches, a lineup, a pipeline. So uh, which uh, essentially at the, the real question becomes how um, long will this uh, rush um, you know, uh, uh, continue? Um, and also in terms of how, uh, what would be the essentially, uh, what it, would it be like at equilibrium? Um, it, it, those are essentially the question that, um, essentially, I guess the timing question is more important. How long will it last? Yeah. Now, great point. I mean, we could be looking back a year from now saying, I can't believe we thought two and a half billion was a lot and that what was going on was exciting. Uh, uh, but we also could see, you know, that there, there could be that equilibrium that comes that involves an actual pullback. But uh I lean towards us being at the start of an inflection in the J curve. So, uh, Fernando, uh, I mean, you you work on one of really the the most exciting premier platforms in DeFi right now. I feel like everyone and their mother is is uh, you know going and creating a pool of of tokens on Balancer. And so, since you power a lot of the liquidity mining programs, uh, I'm just curious, like over the last few weeks, you know, it's, it's not been perfect. I'm wondering like what lessons you would impart to, uh, you know, new DeFi founders or folks that are considering launching a, a liquidity mining program. Yeah, I think it's, it's been great to see projects like Amstable and, and many others using Balancer as a building tool for, for them to, to, to do their own liquidity mining so that the users not only get BAL tokens, but also their uh, native tokens. It's been really great. And I think it's it's all we uh, we could expect. So we, we created Balancer with this idea of it being a primitive. And uh, I like to use this example of this REN, SNX and uh, Curve yield farming scheme where like um, Kane and uh, Taigan, Taiwan, I think his name from REN is they kind of just talked only then without ever talking to us. And they decided to use Balancer uh, as like a central part of, of their um, yeah, idea. And that's to me, the beauty of this, like they haven't asked for permission or they haven't, e they didn't, didn't even need to contact us to ask what we thought. They just went uh, on and, and built it. And um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's been great. And I, I, I saw also BZ uh, X, R BZXR, I think it's their token. They they are also doing this whole new token economics uh, using balancer pools at its core, and we're working with um, many projects to to build smart pools. So smart pools are nothing but a 
a private pool that is very flexible. So all the parameters can change, but the controller of that pool, of that private pool is a smart contract. And that smart contract can get liquidity from outside. So you can put liquidity in that pool through that smart contract. And with that, you can build, for example, surge pricing pools where when there's more uh, volatility, there's more demand for liquidity, the pool just increases the fee, the trading fee. And that thus gets more profitable, attracts more liquidity. And when times are calmer, you can just lower the, the fees and, and, and be more in line with, uh, with the demand for liquidity. So yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited. Yeah, sorry. Did you get, a, did you get inspired by Uber? And that's yeah, the algorithm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Uber, I think, was the best kind of uh, example, or I think maybe the, the first ones. Well, like this ma matching of supply and demand is, is something very old, but I think they brought it to, to a scale. Yeah. And, and to, uh, I, so yeah, I, I actually mentioned that it's the Uber liquidity pool. Uh, but yeah, you, you just just got it. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just the best, like the most efficient way to match the supply and demand. And that's just one of the use cases for smart pools. There's many others like treasury management. So your, your project doesn't need to be overexposed in ETH. And uh, yeah, a balancer pool automatically sells the token that's going up. And yeah, I think there's there's many cool things we'll, we'll be seeing with uh, smart pools in the future. Not sure if I digress too much, but yeah. I, I need to say one thing, like I really love the idea where you kind of like there's like there's the underlying interest or like basically the the earnings and then there's basically your your farming uh, bell and then you can build on top, for example, uh, CRV and, and like all this kind of like things on, on top. And I, I, I call it like vertical farming. And I, I think it's like, <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I really love the concept. But it is, yeah. That's yeah, exactly it's aquaponics. <laughs> yeah, imagine like imagine why would you need to have let's say if you use a a a card of like uh, for for frequent flyer miles like different uh, air uh, airliners and then you have different cards for why why can't you just basically put everything together and just don't worry about that and and just like consume whatever you want to consume like I I definitely love the idea and and I, I think like I will see probably more of this happen. Cool. By the way, Thanks, are, are you all okay to, to go some extra minutes here? Like, could we go another 10 or 15? Um, and, and by the way, you drop off whenever you need, but uh, if, if you're open to it, it just seems like there's a lot, there's a lot more that can still be discussed. Oh, get out a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, uh, I think cool. one of the, one, one of the things, despite all the topics we're covering that we haven't maybe clearly covered is uh, just some like simple examples of yield farming or what Stani just called vertical farming. Um, one of them I wanted to call out was, uh, Fernando just mentioned the, there's this, uh, there's an ability to basically deposit uh, one of the Bitcoin ERC20 tokens into Curve, you earn market making fees, but then on top of it, you earn the Curve governance token when that gets generated in the future. And then you can take what you've received as like your IOU and you can stake it in synthetics, then you can earn SNX. And then on top of that, they're also paying, uh, they're using a balancer pool with uh, SNX and REN, uh, which is also paying you, and also paying you fees then, and also paying you the BAL token. So just count it all up, it's six forms of yield that you're getting. And so that's why this like idea, I think Dan Elitzer uh, was the one who came up with it, yeah. calling it aquaponics. Um, are there any other like, examples that that you all think of that help to take someone from like zero to one and understanding like how this all works or basically how to you know with the few minutes we have left uh, remind us how do we dumb this down for someone to like understand like what building upon that idea of vertical farming or even like airline miles how do you help the average person understand what is yield farming so uh Oh, Tina, you're good now. I think you paused for a second. I'll just jump in here. Um, okay. oh, that's Sam, yeah, Hello? my bad, here we go. Okay, okay. Yeah, Hello? Uh, is Sam, yeah, my voice perfectly clear? Okay, yeah, so 
yeah right now what you explain like the six layer of different uh uh, uh like uh, how user will understand like it, it was quite complicated for me too because i didn't know this whole thing yet so uh, i mean this to understand for user they i mean uh, they face a lot of complexity like uh, i would say this is one of the reason of our current growth with the comp mining because uh, right now if a user wants to do something they want to know understand about the whole six protocols so like they have to know curve they have to know synthetic they have to know balance they have to know all these other protocols that are in the process so they they have to first interact with the curve ui then go to the snx and stake and then go from there to balance or whatever is the process and uh, this is where like i think like these like the mid layer uh, platform like us comes in between uh, who can provide simple recipe or strategies so user just have to do a single transaction and uh, and all these processes are done in the underlying processes and as we support all the different uis so user doesn't have to go anywhere so i think like uh, this to particular to understand like for 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 the users uh, understanding comp uh, how to maximize their comp was quite difficult but once we added the tool for it it was like yeah just uh, you just have to add uh, tokens you just to you just have to leverage it and it's it's all in a single process so you can just go through all of the complexities that is needed uh, to to perform this task so i think like the mid layer platform will help in these all these processes to maximize their uh, yielding at the at the best way possible okay. well i think uh, i want to chime in on i think the uh, the vertical uh, farming aspect i think uh, this is a, a what we are already seeing on almost on a daily basis starting like this week is that we see um, either projects like MCDEX trying to roll out its own structure funds or partnering with like PiDAO who has already built like BTC++ and the USD++ on top of Balancer. Like essentially uh, those communities are actually structuring structure products um, that are essentially an improvement on the UX, on the automation aspect of um, so we see an uh, 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 like essentially a generation of automation, such as uh, like I think Instadev did a great job in terms of uh, simplifying and dumbing it down. I think product level dumbed down of the concept is the most important, but so far it has been more or less focused on uh, automation of, hey, we want to come mining. Uh, well, instead of actually understanding like all the nuances and where to uh, do uh, where to click, where to look. We help you do it all at one click. But um, now I think the game is leveling up uh, as more and more funds, robo funds, we are seeing coming up to the market. And that's essentially, that that's doing the great job of actually educating the market. But that's not doing a great job of educating the market about the risk that we're taking. Well, so who, like, so basically uh, there's always a saying that like, you know, DeFi is on chain. A lot of things are on chain. So it's great that we're re revolutionizing finance. However, um, being able to have data availability on chain doesn't mean that we can overcome our lack of attention and a lack of um, interpretation skills that the great majority of the people needs help on. So essentially people like Gauntlet Network um, essentially buy telling people that the age old pro pro problem of what are we governing? What are the decisions that are implications of our decisions through agent-based simulation models? Like those things are essentially the step one of us revolutionali uh, revolutionizing like the risk industry. Like we're, re we're rebuilding Moody's that failed. Like we're re rebuilding the credit rating agency that collectively failed as an industry. Uh, back in 20, uh, 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 2008. And now that this is where it gets really interesting, it is a, a combination of the automation of the entire uh, processes of, uh, of these uh, building blocks, as well as the um, um, a better improvement on a UX, more from a financial product standpoint uh, than just purely UI uh, cosmetics. Uh, and um, as well as essentially uh, being more informed in terms of the amount of risk that we're taking. And I, uh, and just like what Anna said, everything here that we've, we're seeing, witnessing, um, at hindsight is all predictable um, in the sense that we've gone through the same thing in mining. Um, 
we, um, we, we basically have gone through, essentially uh, altcoin mining went through a very similar phase that people started to mine, like just like skilled um, liquidity miners nowadays, like program their own bots. Um, and, and to the point that they no longer have enough capital to participate, but DeFi changes that in a bit because of the availability of flash loans. So that's still available. However, once that competition um, escalates, essentially the um, uh, smart pools, smart pool wasn't a new term. Smart pool has been around in mining, um, GPU mining for years. And it's all about optimizing the yield and how to uh, take into account the model of your uh, liquidity, uh, your, your liquidation risk. Um, and uh, you're uh, not moving the market too much with your capital. So like we're seeing a much faster uh, evolution in DeFi, um, taking into account all the learnings in automation and in terms of understanding the risk and uh, simplifying it so, uh, so that our average user essentially can be able to sleep on um, a service. That, and we're, we're, we're marching towards that. I think we're still uh, far from it, but I think that's where the industry really grows how, in order to really absorb uh, you know, more capital into, uh, into this. Yeah. yeah, I agree with Tina. I would only just say that we have definitely very long automation and we short risk management. That's great. Yeah, um, I know Stani's gonna have to hop in a moment. I wanted to, uh, after that, Jean, I, I really wanted you to share also uh, just how you think about risk uh, in terms mm -hmm. of MC Dex, with just all this being newer and launching with the liquidity mining. But um, Stani, just out of respect for the fact you need to hop shortly, uh, uh, anything else that you wanted to share in terms of how you've been thinking about liquidity mining in relation to Lend? Uh, I know uh, I've used Lend, your native token for Ave. I've used it as collateral, and then I recognize it as a governance token. So I guess I'm wondering, like has the last few months like inspired you all with more ideas or are you thinking about new incentives for Lend? Or, or by the way, whatever you can share, I, I don't, maybe I'm tapping into something that's sensitive, but uh, just let us know. Oh, oh me, right? Or? <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put you on the spot. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sir. yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think like, uh, as I said, like the liquidity minings are pretty good. And I, I think uh, like uh, definitely like, for example, what uh, Fernando and his team has done pretty interestingly is like found basically sweet spots, how to reward. And I'd really like the uh, thing that basically you, you start with off chain. And once you have a model that works, then you can basically bring it on chain and, and that way. So you don't kind of like go uh, the cart, cart before the wheels. And I, I think like in our perspective, like we really love the, the, the comp model and the liquidity farming. And in one way it, it should, should have taken liquidity away from Aave, but we have grown a lot. So it shows like that it grows the whole ecosystem. In our case, like with the uh, Lend token, we have a slightly different model in the sense, well, maybe a quite more because uh, we do have uh, uh, liquidity incentives but the idea is that when you earn liquidity incentives you're staking it back into the uh, ecosystem and the main purpose of like this is to actually kind of like have utility for uh, the land token to to use in the ecosystem to secure the depositors so you could as a uh, already token holder because we already have a token so we we come from a different perspective from from the community perspective and we want them to be able to use the token to secure the network and in essence, uh, how it works is that you, you stake a token and, and basically uh, that uh, token is, is basically and the market capitalization of that stake is used to secure the deposits uh, of the liquidity providers. So basically if there's a shortfall event, which could be a smart contract hack or a failed liquidation, basically part of that uh, stake could be slashed, which is basically 30%. And what the slash doesn't cover, let's say if the deficit is even more, we have this kind of like a maker style uh, minting functionality of the protocol uh, recovery. And the way we kind of designed it, we're very lucky uh, that we had people like uh, the, the, the balancer team, the comp team and the maker team uh, and, and a bunch of other events that happened during the past six months as a kind of like a business cases for us to, to investigate like, what could go wrong and also like how you could incentivize uh, your 
uh, community or your, your users. And basically we uh, build this kind of like a backstop module as well. So you can stake also stable coins. So all this slash mint or mint that land uh, are actually on the market and with the backstop order that is uh, bidding for the market price. Uh, kind of like if, if uh, the idea is that we incentivize to get the uh, land back uh, from the market. And it's kind of like a system we, we see that uh, where we have the incentives in a way that uh, if you earn those incentives by providing liquidity and by using, uh, you can kind of like a compound them back into the uh, ecosystem and secure it. So in one way you can be a liquidity provider and, and basically, uh, but like we want to avoid that uh, land is, is, is kind of like a part of the interest uh, earnings. Like we want it to be like a earning, but in a, in a way that uh, you kind of like, uh, participate back into the network. And I, I think like synthetics has done, like it has, the project has ups and downs. So I, I definitely think so. But uh, some of the things that they have done very well is that they're experimenting a lot and a lot of different kinds of uh, incentive schemes. So I, I think these projects that ha have come earlier with, with this kind of like a DeFi scaled uh, uh, models, I, I think they have really uh, been helpful, helpful for us to, to craft a model that we uh, we think it's it's good. So we try to balance a bit uh, between incentivizing liquidity and and also uh, basically uh, securing the network. And we also have uh, this kind of uh, vertical farming there. So the idea is that you you farm first whatever you get from from providing liquidity, then you farm on top of the by securing the network, and also your liquidity will be used uh, basically by providing the land liquidity in secondary market. Uh, and I, I probably will, I, I can't tell any more about this, but like, I, I probably, uh, it will be public at some close point. So I, I think that will explain a bit more, but I, I hope you get the kind of like, uh, the, uh, over overview. <laughs> Thanks Don. Yeah. I yeah, appreciate you sharing. I know it's, uh, it sometimes there, these are topics that can't be discussed until they're public. So makes sense. Um, Gene, what, how do you think about, uh, I'm going back to like all of this discussion about risk and, and mm -hmm. thinking about uh, creating incentives that can't be gamed. How, how have you all been thinking about that uh, with the growth of liquidity on the Monte Carlo decks? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, as I just mentioned that like the growing liquidity is actually one of the points to uh, accelerate the whole growth of the whole ecosystem. But we do realize that like for the LPs that who provide the liquidity, uh, besides earn some use, there are some risks involved uh, when they're doing this. Uh, you know, like because we are doing the perpetual contracts, there are positions with leverage involved. So when they are doing this, they might be, they are, do, uh, they are actually being the counterparty of the traders. So that means that they are taking positions with leverage. So um, yeah, we actually spend a lot of, lots of time to educate the market or educate the community about the, uh, by providing the, by providing the liberty to the, to the AMM that they, they did enjoy, they did have some risk exposures. And uh, we, ho we hope that like the, the, the LP can realize those uh, risk exposures before they're doing that. So yeah, that's something that we have been like we have been doing and spent a uh, tons of time to the market market education part. And uh, the second thing that I want to mention is like mm, because you know like everything is quite at an initial stage that we regard everything as an experiment because you know for this round of our liquidity mining we just. Uh, we just have it for only one month because we do think that like that everything is shifting rapidly that maybe next next month something happened that we need to incentivize users in another way like that probably will happen because it's changing too fast so yeah we regarded uh every round of incentive as an experiment and uh, we just like uh react fast about uh, react fast based on the market uh, feedbacks of, 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 of the whole design system. Yeah, I think that's a two points I want to share. No, thanks, Jean. Uh, I, I think we should wrap here pretty soon. Um, I'm just wanting to give you each a chance to share any sort of final thoughts on 
maybe like what what is one takeaway that you hope someone uh, remembers about yield farming or or even like a resource to go to to learn more about this um anyways um who would like to go first um uh, i'll just uh, uh, i'll just uh, stay on the security point of view uh, the one that not much people are discussing so i mean uh, the co- companies or protocols are basically distributing their governance i think like there is also a huge risk here like how much governance you want to distribute to the users um let's i'll just i'll just take a small example here let's say uh, a company distributed more than 50% of this shares to the users uh let's say governance tokens to the users and now uh, a borrow and lending platform uh, let's say compound and a listed their token as a collateral okay so now users will start using their tokens to deposit collateral and borrow against uh, borrow against it so uh, all the like many users will uh, start depositing their uh, assets there and they will borrow against it and let's say if the pool at certain point of time crosses more than 50% then anyone or any big user in the ecosystem can deposit a lot of uh, stable coins borrow all the governance token and vote something against on the protocol uh, yeah so yeah, i mean this, this, this is, is a simple. yeah simple models this, don't yeah worry. i mean uh, this yeah so this is uh, something some uh, other kind of risk that no one uh, really talks about but in the long term this kind of risk is, might be possible so yeah i mean the i, I want to state this risk like yeah oh, thanks sam yeah, i mean any other thoughts in, on that sorry anna go ahead yeah yeah to some extent um it, so it actually has been discussed quite a lot but it was probably about let's say 2 years ago plus um you know essentially simple you know one token one vote governance models that don't work and they inevitably lead to uh you know essentially kleptocracy or, you know oligopoly you know essentially the you know the rule of the uh wealthy of the whales and this is the biggest um um well the really trap that that ethereum based projects and ethereum itself are trying to escape or have been trying to escape right so there are projects that s- specifically worked on governance models um you, you know like dao stack some i'm sure you know you've heard of them right and a few others that yeah working essentially on more representative uh, so on chain governance models i think what we haven't seen so far is because things have moved so quickly is actually seeing those more representative models connecting with defi protocols and i think it's probably a really good time to reach out to those folks and say like this is actually your first crypto native use case where people are engaged where the economic outcomes really incentivize governance turnouts right but if we stick to simplistic you know one token one vote model is going to be is going to be vcs and whales dominating uh, which you know which kind of defeats the purpose of the whole exercise any other thoughts on that tina did did you want to chime in on anything else there i i love the fact we're we're this is it was designed to be on yield farming but everything is so interconnected or interwoven in our space that like of course we're on to systemic risk which is incredibly important to talk about and uh governance you know it just it's all interwoven i mean that that's the point of yield farming is to distribute those governance tokens but um it's been a interesting meme uh, at least to get people's attention so uh tina any other thoughts on that oh you're muted tina there we go yeah uh i totally uh, i think uh what sam and anna brought up is one of the very important aspect of the challenge of designing a uh a, a liquidity mining program for uh essentially defi projects um and the challenge is not just unique to DeFi, it's unique to anything protocols to be governed. However, what's different here is that um, uh, the, the amount of, essentially the po- uh, portion of control released 
um, is one of the important aspects of, uh, of the balancing. There's another aspect, which essentially is um, kind of product market fit uh, of or uh, the product development, the, what stage you are at in, uh, in, in terms of product. So even like uh, for everyone who's on this panel, um, I would say the design goals, in fact, of these individual liquidity mining programs are a bit different. Compound has a different game than actually Aave. It's similar. It's more similar to Aave, less similar to Balancer, less similar to MCDEX because of the fact of its uh, market leadership position and more because of essentially uh, what a huge part of its success has to do with the alignment of the capital that has gone in beforehand and the listing of Coinbase that wasn't happening overnight, it was planned. So a lot of those are the th things that early, early stage products like um, MacDex is facing a different challenge. I would call McDex and Balancer a little bit more towards actually bootstrapping for user growth. However, those two are also different in terms of these two mechanisms uh, or what they're designing for. And so that the risk is also different. McDex is actually trying to um, fill up the last part of the puzzle. If, if no one is liquidity mining uh, on its AMM, then it's entire value proposition of an ETH perpetual, of a perpetual swap, that is funding rate is determined on chain through the AMM would not work, period. So it's a last bit, which is a very clever design, but in order for that to work, it must actually have liquidity mining. So to actually have liquidity providers providing liquidity to an AMM that actually works um, in terms of keeping the funding rate um, updated. Whereas um, Balancer has a, like, it's more like an amplifier, the liquidity mining for its core product. However, if you look at some, I'm not going to name names of other certain projects that have tried liquidity mining or are trying continually, which is great, um, I think, uh, in terms of learning and feedback, um, has more to do with, like, essentially, they're paying for governance learning, and they're paying for, essentially, um, you would see, you, we could actually, um, um, I'll be very interested to see the industry come up with a metric of the efficiency of the liquidity mining programs on behalf of the project in terms of value creation. Um, uh, basically, uh, uh, the, the, the essence of it is if your product is too generalized, you don't, you have a thousand user activities you actually want to incentivize instead of one. Um, and those are not uniform, not homogeneous. That's going to actually diffuse you all of your tokens uh, you incentivize, it will be no different than any of the random cashback program that does not necessarily have an economic system. It would just be paying for people's gas. It's essentially the same kind of, um, you are, you are essentially uh, directing actions in not a uniform direction, but in a very uh, diverse way, which actually doesn't necessarily translate to much of value creation. Um, and also, in fact, you will quickly have people essentially just to do certain recapture like um, mechanic Turk type of actions just so to earn that particular set of token. However, it doesn't, um, where, whereas that in, uh, 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 incentivized action may be only accounting for your entire product's 1% of core user, core game loop. So, uh, so I guess the, 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 to summarize, if you can, mo many of the product actually are not at a stage to define their core game loop or what is the one single action type of action you would like your users to do. And if that is not able to be defined, essentially you are just essentially using liquidity mining as a marketing tool to draw in discussion, which yes, uh, it's about buying a vote um, on, on the, it's about using your action to earn a vote, but the question, the problem is actually in crypto governance in the DeFi governance as well. You can, you don't need to have uh, you can have a voice on social media and still be influencing the protocol development and not necessarily have to have to take a vote in it. So the real question becomes in those uh, products that doesn't have much of a product market fit or don't know where to actually incentivize, it may be less efficient than the products that are designed uh, that's ripe for incentive mechanism. Yeah, absolutely. And then it basically becomes a glorified airdrop. Yes, exactly. Do you think 
uh, I know we have to wrap here any minute, but uh, just you said so many interesting things, Tina. And, and I wonder, do you ever think about uh, the spectrum of attention that one gets or that, a, a, let's say, a, a DeFi platform gets can be both good and bad? Like I, I think about, again, I've, I've been watching McDex or MC Dex. I love the fact people call it McDex. It sounds like McDonald's to me. It's delicious. Um, uh, anyways, when, when I use McDex, uh, it, it, is, it is very clear that uh, you all need liquidity in order for this thing to be successful. And the spread right now is 0.06%, which is awesome. That's a mark. That's definitely a mark of success. And anyways, just, I guess like it's so simple that it leaves less room, in my opinion, for someone to game the system. But at the same time, too, maybe it doesn't create the frenzy. You know, like I, I actually, I, I really do think McDex has been, it's kind of remarkable that you all are around like 18,000 ETH on, on margin right now. Uh, but I also recognize, too, that, you know, I, I, I think there's been, again, less of that frenzy. So I guess, Tina, just to cap it off, like, do you, do you think about that the spectrum of attention, like being, is it a double edged sword? And like, how, how is a team like, let's say uh, Acropolis, which already has a token, if they were to design in the future, uh, and uh, Anna, you should weigh in on this, too, obviously, if, if you design these intentions in the future with liquidity mining, how do you do it so that those intentions are pure, you know, so that, you, you know, so that you're not accused of doing it for the wrong reasons and creating like a backlash with a liquidity mining or yield farming program. Cool. Is this for me or for Tina? Oh, either of you. I meant to ask That's Tina true. first, but I, I just was, I, I, she just made so many interesting points there and That's no, not, either of you, it's your platform. Yeah, I, I just, I'm gonna, Metropolis, yeah. <laughs> I'm on the same, um, we're willing to, uh, yeah, Stina is in this regard. So we, you know, we took our time to still make sure that the product solves a need that would be uh, using it ourselves. Um, and got really good feedback uh, from beta testers. But ultimately, um, uh, because the liquid, the capital is so liquid, um, so fluid, the only way you can, you know, you can capture and you know encourage stickiness on your product is if you deliver value and if you do something that's that's genuinely differentiated, right? Um, uh, because the switching costs are so low, right? Um, and if I want to be switching, uh, I, uh, and you know we are essentially a sort of middle layer solution, right? So the switching costs are low. Um, you know, is there a, a strong brand loyalty in crypto? I, I would say zero, um, right? So, you, you know, that, that really keeps you on your toes uh, in terms of, okay, um, not only should we be, uh, be able to offer um, a, you know, solution to, to, to real demand outside of the, let's say, crypto Twitter eco chamber that, you know, sometimes people forget that's not the real world. It's just one subset of opinions, right? And it's a very, very small subset of opinions, right? In other words, what, what most people need is just um, a reliable above bank interest rate on the deposits for the deposits being insured and, and ideally not rateable by a third party. And this is where it stops, <laughs> right? You know, whereas um, generally what I find is that there's, there's this, you know, bias to, uh, to create impressively complex uh, kind of you know, multi-layer verticals structures that we don't necessarily understand the consequence of, but it's, it's ultimately, you know, a game of Jenga because the, um, because the contagion risk in Ethereum DeFi is massive. Like USDT breaks the bag, the whole thing is fucked. <laughs> and, you know, we just need to be completely cognizant of this, right? So, you know, specifically, you know, in our case, we didn't rush with how we're gonna, you know, with um, kind of rolling out our, you know, element incentives um, 
and ultimately for us the objective is to you know is to is to incentivize stickiness and uh, uh, saving so we so we incentivize um for time right so the more productive time um you know, in, in terms of the yield that you get on your savings on a you know on a platform so to speak uh this is the, just you know the simplest solution and the, uh, very similar to balance we'll be iterating and reviewing uh, the data on the on a monthly basis and uh, you know reviewing what works and what doesn't work yeah i, I think what um uh, i think uh anna and balancer are and also mc Dex are doing is essentially taking a very iterative approach which is at the core because at any moment in time we always had that classical problem of regardless of what uh, uh whether we're in DeFi or crypto or even elsewhere um the principal agent problem of uh, essentially what the decision makers, you want to keep the decision makers, the ones who actually have the power as much informed as possible, as little information asymmetry as possible to the actual core activities of your protocol, uh, uh, be it, uh, and, and have them closer to the role uh, that they should be playing. So that's essentially, I guess that's more of a framework in thinking uh, in terms of how to um, design such mechanisms that have resilience. Um, and in terms of just, just in terms of certain heuristics, you essentially, you want to have a flexible iterative approach, but you don't want it to change so much. You don't want essentially it to have wild swings that people's attention spans are limited. They cannot keep up with um, so much drama that's going on. Uh, they lose track after a month um, uh, because it has changed so much, then that's bad. That's a, essentially, it's a, uh, it's a fine balance of essentially how, uh, how much room you create for the design space uh, for the commons. And in terms of what you can do as essentially as a uh, community is really about uh, if the core of the community, which essentially probably is the strongest voice at the beginning is the team, is to provide the tools that makes it extremely, extremely easy to interpret um, uh, these uh, uh, information uh, and also to interpret and partner with essentially any uh, essentially uh, partnership that helps with automation and helps with interpretation of risk to provide a coherent feedback loop. This is a challenge that has been ongoing for governance for uh, layer one protocols as well as for this. So that's, that's essentially what the teams like us, we can do what, when it comes to it. It's about parameterization, like kind of setting it. You would never get it absolutely correct, but you need to essentially understand what is the consequences when you initialize, when you initialize the, the, the parameters. And, in, and also in terms of uh, just make it as conveniently have creating visual feedback loop, creating, um, you know, uh, essentially um, all the metrics, make it available and work essentially uh, inviting powerful partners who are actually be able to interpret uh, what is going on to help the providing value to the entire community in reinterpreting what is every single decision that everyone is making, uh, revealing the, the consequences. And I think lastly, um, the, uh, 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 what, what is here is, is more of an art than a science. And um, it's, uh, so it's all of these, uh, essentially what we see as attempt, what you do now, is gonna be very different from what you do three weeks ago, or what you design. And especially, um, um, and it will be very different from a year from now, but the design has to take into also assumption, the rate of change. You, essentially, you can almost anticipate the evolution of market sentiment, of public sentiment and enthusiasm and do price in the fact that you need stronger stimulants. You would need inevitably bigger carrots to always get the attention, the five minutes of fame. Uh, and that's something that I think the startup world and the web 2.0 has already trained every one of us. But here it's about conveying that message uh, in a more explicit way to your community, to your stakeholder uh, of this, with the meaning of this carrot, rather than just to throw it out there like in web two, because the decision-making is not at your hand, it's already being released. So I think that's 
I guess my my two gui. Now the gas is so expensive; it's not worth that much. <laughs> uh, well, hey, uh, thank thank you to everyone. I, I, this was awesome. I, I probably we could go on for several hours here. There's just like so many interesting points. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, we will have this uh, available available for playback on the Ethereal YouTube channel. Also, uh, we have a Discord. If anyone goes to etherealsummit.com, there's an Ethereal Discord. There's a POAP, Proof of Attendance Protocol channel. Go there. Uh, all you have to do is share a public Ethereum wallet address that's yours. So be conscious of uh, sharing something you're okay with anyone obviously seen there in the channel. And... Uh, uh, you can then you'll get this badge, which is an NFT, and it actually allows you to vote in the future on polls that we run. But uh, other than that, just thanks so much. I mean, it's so interesting. I'm I'm happy you were able to stick with us a little bit longer and continue the discussion uh, with a smaller group. And uh, also, just as a reminder, we connected today, folks from we had Stani in Finland, Fernando in Brazil, Tina's in San Francisco. Anna's in uh, London, I think, or the UK, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Jean's in Beijing and uh, Sam is in Australia. So just, it's kind of just mind blowing, like all the uh, community building we get to do while we're all stuck in quarantine. Uh, but yeah, a- anything else folks you want to share before we go? Like any, yeah, please remind folks, uh, we have Acropolis with uh, Anna. Anna, check her, check out her company at Acropolis. Uh, check out mcdex.io, which is uh, Jean's company. Check out honeylemon.market, which is uh, Tina's company. And then check out Instadap, uh, which is Sam Sam and his brother started that. Awesome. All good? Thank you. Keep coming. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. We'll Thank see you in two you. weeks. Bye. 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 Okay, bye.